Hey everybody, welcome. Today we're going to be jumping into Gospel of John chapter 2. If you haven't been with us or, or you're new to this, this is just a daily time in the Word. Um, I was calling it Bible study, but I was thinking about it more. And, uh, you know, to be honest, like I go out of my way every time to mention that this is not a pre-planned sermon, uh, not a, a studied uh, you know, studied out, planned thing. This is simply me reading my Bible <laughs> along with you, hopefully. The goal of this really is to provide an opportunity for those that maybe don't know how or you're too busy or I don't know what it is. I don't think anybody's too busy, but for those that struggle with just getting in the Bible and understanding it, um, I just want to invite you along with the journey of me getting in God's Word for 15 minutes a day. 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is. And I want to encourage you guys that, you know, I would typically spend more than 15 minutes, uh, spend time in prayer, in worship. Um, you know, you could find all kinds of great music online. And if you don't have any services, you can at least go to YouTube. I mean, The Upper Room, Bethel, Hillsong, just amazing. So, um, you know, it's good to just spend time, sometimes just listening, sometimes praying, sometimes worshiping, sometimes reading the word. Um, but end of the day, whatever it is that you do, uh, they're all supposed to be means to an end. And the, the end is relationship with the person of Jesus. So anyway, we got to jump into it. So if you have a Bible, uh, I hope that you're following along. If not, you can see it on your screen there. We're in John chapter two. Subtitle is The Wedding at Cana. Uh, so this is what it says. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So Jesus' mom, Mary, was at the wedding. For whatever reason, they thought that that was important to notate first. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? So, again, this is not uh, necessarily meant to be primarily me teaching. Um, I'm just inviting you into me reading. And uh, if, you know, if there's something that I feel like I know I can share with you that would be beneficial, I'll, I'll try and do that. But point of saying that is that in this particular case, this is an example of me reading and don't necessarily know exactly uh, why it's starting out with Jesus's first miracle being one about alcohol, uh, about wine, why certain things are worded the way that they are, like her, the reference to her being the mother of Jesus um, instead of just, you know, Jesus's mom. Uh, of course, Greek has different ways of wording things, but that seems kind of intentional to me. Um, so I don't know exactly the meaning. And then I've heard the discussion on this before, you know, woman, um, you know, was it a negative term, you know, in our culture, if you say, hey, woman, that's kind of negative, but I don't know if that's necessarily true of their culture. Um, so I've heard it taught actually both sides. One is like, it's just kind of disrespectful. One is like that it's actually a term of honor. Uh, I, I don't know if it really matters, but these are just some thoughts that I have as I'm reading stuff like this. So he asked this question, though, which I think that this is more important. You know, she says they have no wine. And he says, what does that have to do with me? Like, why are you asking me about alcohol? And uh, and then he says this, my hour has not yet come. So I think that that's significant. Um I think that he's referring to really his purpose on the earth and which of course is his death, burial and resurrection, but his hour, it seems through the rest of scripture, uh, when he says my hour, it, it's, it's kind of talking about that specific week. They call it the passion week, but also, um, you know, is really three years before, um, his death that he came on the scene, which is right here with the beginning of his ministry. But I, I get the impression that he's basically making making the statement that hey I'm not gonna I don't want to do too many miracles right now and you know give up uh, who I am and have people go you know go bonkers right away and 
because I think he, he eventually knew that it would lead him to the cross. He had work to do prior to that. At least those are the things that I'm thinking about when I read this. Uh, verse 5, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So it's sort of like this, hey, what do I have to do with that? And then she just says, well, I think you'll do something. So he says, she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, were there, there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. So these jars full of water were for washing. Each holding 20 or 30 gallons, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water that now had become wine, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs. So, this miracle of turning water into wine and getting the people at the party to be excited about the fact that it was it was good wine, uh, saved towards the end, uh, was specifically the first sign or miracle that the gospel went out of its way to describe to us. Jesus did this at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. I would say when I read that, it strikes me as important. Manifestation meaning uh, the physical expression of, the revealing of his glory. Uh, I don't know what church you grew up in, but something to do with alcohol <laughs> wouldn't necessarily be considered, uh, you know, glory, but, uh, or glorious, but that in this case is what, what they're saying, that through this miracle, he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Interesting that they were already his disciples following him. And yet their level of belief constantly grew. Um, and I think that that can be the case for us too. You can begin following Jesus. You could be a disciple. And yet you're going to go from level to level to level. As you trust him and follow him and he proves himself, then you believe more and then you repeat. And so it's cool. Verse 12. After he... After this, he went down to Carpenon with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. So, you know, this whole last passage here, I don't know. Much has been said about it. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on it. And, you know, that's kind of the way that when you do a, your Bible study time or your devotional time and whenever you do it, that it's okay that sometimes some scriptures stick out to you and sometimes they don't. And... In this case today, uh, I just let's just move on. Uh, but hey, if there's something that is meaningful to you and sticking out to you, then I invite you to share it in the comments and maybe I'll challenge somebody else. Verse 13, the Passover, the Ju Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This is a little thing, but um, I don't know. If you're like me and you hear the terms, like directional terms, just so you know, anytime you're talking about going to Jerusalem, they're typically going to use the term going up to. And if they're going anywhere else, they're going to use the term going down. Whereas we might say you only use the term going down if you're going south. Um, but Jerusalem was, you know, higher elevation. And so it's reflected in the scriptures. Anyway, that's a side note. Uh, verse 14. In the temple... He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, 
Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. To me, that's something I, I just wonder where, where it came from. So it might be something that I'd go back and study later. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So we're going to see that this, this declaration uh, is significant moving forward. It's even going to be one of the things that they criticize or like accuse him of legally um, in the future. <clears throat> and so much has been said about that, but I think it's pretty clear that he wasn't talking about the temple that they were in. He was talking about the temple of his body and that his body would be buried and three days later rise. That that would be not the sign right there in the moment for them, but that would be the ultimate sign for all of humanity to see. And the Jews said, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up after three days? Which is funny because, you know, they didn't question that he's going to destroy it or anything like that. They still think he's talking about the building. And they didn't question that he's going to destroy it. You know, they just questioned if he destroyed it, are you really going to be able to build it in three days? Uh, I don't know. That's funny to me. But anyway, verse 21. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed in the scripture. They believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So here we have the second time where it says they believed in this case, the scripture and the word. So we see here that, uh, you know, they're growing in their belief of him. They're growing in their belief of him. And uh, that's cool. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, actually, let me back up. A lot has been said about this temple thing. And um, I just want to say this. I remember I was when I was younger, I definitely had this impression that if anything ever was sold in a church building, that it was clearly against what Jesus would want. And after more study and uh, really looking into this, because that's a very important issue to me, or at least it was to me personally, not to intertwine, you know, uh, secular materialism and the pursuit of money with, with God's house. I came to realize that this passage, um, you know, is talking about, people doing personal, private, for-profit business in God's house, not using the temple for its original purpose, but doing business there. And so he was furious with that. Um, at least in my church, anything that we sell is only sold to, uh, and, and any profits that are made always go back into God's work, not to somebody's private business account or anything like that. So I think that when you we see like a coffee shop in a church or a bookstore or clothing being sold or something like that, and I think personally what's really important is to see what is the purpose of it and is that somebody conducting personal business or, um, you know, is that money going towards uh, God's kingdom and the ministry to actually further what he his hope is for his temple. So anyway, that's just kind of my thoughts on the passage. Could be wrong. You could correct me. Um, and so that's just kind of where I'm at right now. Verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. Many other people believed. There's that word again. And here's this really important word. Uh, his name. Remember I said uh, earlier on that that's going to be a theme that continues to come back and be really important that it's his name that is the thing that represents him and the thing that's so, so important. They believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to wear, bear witness about, and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself 
knew what was in man. I feel like that that's talking about uh, he he just didn't he wasn't ready and he knew that that man's heart was evil. So here we are, John chapter two. I'm left asking myself, what's the takeaway from this? You know, there's a wedding with wine and a miracle. There's Jesus in the temple. There's many people believed in him and he didn't entrust himself over to men. Um, I would say I'm going to walk away from, from this, uh, this time today, uh, you know, probably focusing on this passage right in here uh, about God's house being a house of prayer. I'm actually not even seeing it here in this in this uh, reading here in John, but I do remember from other gospels that he talks about in the other accounts that it, talk about him flipping the tables and all that in the temple, that he specifically says, "Don't make this uh, church a den of robbers, but my father's house will be called a house of prayer." And so, uh, to me. That's something that I would uh, be encouraged by today, that uh, Jesus has zeal, zeal for God's house, zeal for his father's house, zeal for what's being done in his father's house, passion for the use of the church building, passion, not just for the physical temple, but passion for what's being done in that space. That's supposed to be a sacred space. It's supposed to be used for sacred purposes to build God's kingdom in the hearts of men and women. And so when they turn it into a business, place of business, uh, they completely missed it. And so it just encourages me to remember that, that I now am God's temple. And Though, of course, we have to live life and, and work and make money and do all those things. But the, the ultimate lesson for me would be that, hey, my life, uh, all that I am belongs to God. My body is his temple. My spirit is his temple. My mind is his temple. I am where he dwells. You, in you is where he dwells. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have faith in him. And that we have to remember that we need to keep pure our temple for his purposes, that we need to put his will and his way first and foremost among, uh, before anything else that we're pursuing. So those are kind of be my takeaways from this section. And uh, I, I'd love to hear what it is that maybe God's speaking. That's just what he's speaking to me. I'd love to hear what he's speaking to you. And uh, hey, if uh, these videos are helping you and there's anybody you can think of that would love uh, or that would benefit from them, make sure you tag them in the comments below. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit subscribe and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.